dear friends. First of all, I am very grateful to you for inviting me to this uh, Sir Sayyad lecture. And uh, when I am talking about Sir Sayyad and uh, today's condition, one thing very, very immediately strikes me. As our friend was telling us the backdrop in which Sir Sayyad had come and diagnosed the problem of Muslim community about the education and other things, let's imagine that backdrop. That backdrop was 1857. Right, 1857, where I think the spark was given by Mangal Pandey, and the 1857 rebellion, revolt, revolution, whatever you call, was led by Bahadur Shah Zafar. Bahadur Shah Zafar had different associates. They were Hindus as well as Muslims. It was a revolt of peasants on one side because peasants were very much disturbed by the new taxation system imposed by the British. Now what British did, of course, uh, uh, since you are many of your students, of course, due apologies to the faculty here, many of your students, I, I will go on giving some references. Some from YouTube, some from Professor Google, whatever suits you, you can <laughs> use all, all of them. So first reference I want to give you is that from the YouTube. And that is uh, Shashi Tharoor Oxford lecture, lecture, debate, 15 minutes. Only 15 minutes is there. It tells us how British uh, plundered our society and uh, they took away all the wealth. Now the backdrop I am trying to prepare is that it was earlier to British, there were many Muslim kings. Now first let's realize none of the king was ruling all over this land, number one. Number two, you cannot properly call it as India at that time, right? Uh, actually according to me, India came to be through the freedom movement. Earlier there were many kingdoms and the religion of the king cannot be the marker of the society. Now this painful thing I am saying because today for us for example there is a very popular perception some of the things I am very disturbed so I keep breaking those perceptions and while talking of 1857 that perception is very important. One perception comes and that comes from the highest to the every level that uh, you know uh, India was a slave country from last 1400 years. I hope you must be knowing, even our Prime Minister, I'll be quoting, not in a negative way. Uh, he also said, oh, India was a slave for 1400 years. Now, what is slavery of a country? Slavery of a person? These are very specific categories. But they have been abused recklessly by the communal politics which has come up. And that dominates our social thinking. Anyway, so British on one side. And the other side, the re rebellion, revolt, was by the lot sections of people. Number one, landlords, kings and princes, they were disturbed by the new pattern introduced by British. Peasants, they were very disturbed. They were very disturbed because whole the system of taxation was uh, done upside down and the peasants were a big victim of, that, victim of that. So this was the cause of the rebellion. How it was perceived by the British? British saw that it is the Muslims rebelling against the empire. So what do they do? Once they are successful in recovering their rhythm, once they are successful in coming back to power fully, the first thing they do is to left, right and center do lot of atrocities on Muslims. Why? They did atrocities on everybody. But why Muslims are selected? Because they thought it is the Muslims who have led the rebellion. According to me, it was not a Hindu or a Muslim rebellion. It was a rebellion of different princely states, different peasant groups, and the peasants as such who were going on. But basic point is that, that was a time, because of the British repression, the Muslim community as such came under big amount of setback, number one. Number two, at the same time, because of British rule, just don't think that I am going to paint British or Americans only in black color. There are different shades, some good, some bad, some central core, something, something good is happening. What is good is happening? British also bring in modern education, replacing the old madrasa and gurukul, both. Let me balance it out, otherwise one is easily targeted. Oh, you are like that. Okay. So, there is a madrasa, there is gurukul. British brought in the modern education. Now, in modern education, all the elites are not able to take advantage. So Hindu elites basically take a bigger advantage. Why I am using the word elite? Because even this till time, till this time, the lower caste, the Rohit Vemulas, we are not coming to the forefront. For them, 
we needed Jyoti Rao Phule. Girls were not coming forward. So for that, we need, needed Savitri Bai Phule. After which, others also started taking advantage of modern education. So what was Sir Sayal's diagnosis? His diagnosis was that Muslim elite are falling backward because of the lack of education. So that was a central powerful message which he lived in his life and brought all those changes related to education. Now why I am re re remembering this? That was a time when the British ruling authorities were targeting Muslims as a community. That it is because of Muslims that 1857 rebellion took place. Now today, what do I see? Today in place of British, there is some other power, Washington, White House, and they very cleverly have targeted from 9-11-2001 that terrorism has its root in Quran, terrorism has its foundation amongst Muslims. That popular formula which many of the people keep saying, all Muslims are not terrorists, don't worry, all are not terrorists. All Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. So that popular formula was the handiwork of American media. I know many of you will be aspiring to go to US, please go, no, not a problem. But I am talking of American global policies, American state. After 9-11, what do the American media, what does it do? It simply popularizes the slogan, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And that is then again picked up. There are other people waiting for such, such, uh, handy things for them to use in their politics. So there are some of them are in India also. They picked it up and then they try to broaden it. And that's where I'll begin in some popular way probably since you're students, I generally take the liberty of having an interactive mode. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Now, so some of the terrorists I remember, before coming to this listing of the terrorists, I am reminded of one thing. Who is a terrorist? Surprisingly, surprisingly, all over the world, terrorism is being talked about. Not in one fora, terrorism has been defined successfully, nor not even in the papers and the documents of United Nations, terrorism has not been defined properly. Everybody will talk, fight against terror, you know. Those people, two big prime ministers meet each other, ah, let's come together to fight against terror. But hello, what is terror? That they don't know, and they don't want to define. Either they don't know, or they don't want to define. They define the act of terror. But of course, uh, I, one of my friend, very close friend, she tried to come to a very functional definition of terrorism. But don't take it very literally. This again, probably that's what science means. You keep building up upon our knowledge. Try to go on improving whatever you know. So one of my friends, uh, she tried to define. It is an act act whose agenda is political. So first thing, already something is there. A political agenda in which people are killed for some political goal. So two or three things. There is somebody who is a perpetrator of this action. There is some political goal. And there is some victim who may be generally, generally innocent. Right? So this is one. When I define this, the first thing which comes up, sometimes which is not talked about, I have gone through, the, did the survey of some books on terrorism. By and large, people are quiet on one type of terrorism which takes place by the state. Very dangerous area. Obviously, it is very dangerous to talk like this today because today is a time, last few months, few years, a few months particularly is a time when the anti-national label is, has been distributed a plenty. Means anybody, oh, Rohit Vimula is doing this anti national. You have organized a meeting in GNU, anti national. And all our TV anchors are having a gala time because this is such a lovely thing to insight. Okay, so that's why I'll have to be a bit careful about it. Now, this whole thing of uh, definition of terror, and from definition of terror, two points I can say that sometimes when we mention the terror, very popularly, somebody I may call as a terrorist. He may, he or she may be a hero for somebody else. Personal example, I was in Tamil Nadu, Chennai, and giving a talk 10 years, uh, 10, 8 years ago on terrorism. And I there mentioned about LTTE. I hope friends still recall, Liberation Tiger of Tamil Nadu, right? They still recall. I said that is the biggest terrorist organization in the world. Because I am trying to compare Al-Qaeda 
which we will come shortly versus LTT. And I said LTT that time was the biggest terrorist organization in the world. Friends sitting in the audience, they came pouncing upon me. They said, how can you call them ter terrorist LTT? Is it fighting the battle of liberation? I said, fine, same thing is there. And the very classical example of Bhagat Singh, is he a terrorist or is he a freedom fighter? Very, very, very vague area. But of course, as such, let's leave aside the uh, definition of terrorism. By and large, I said, an act which kills innocent people or which who has not done a direct crime, but it is aimed at a political goal. Now, before I go further, now terrorist act, we can begin. And some of the terrorists popularly perceived, those who have killed people, some of the names I like you to recite, which are very simple. Can friends tell me who killed Mahatma Gandhi, father of the nation? Very intimate question. Yes, so which religion he belonged to? Hindu religion. Okay, number one. Who killed Indira Gandhi in 1984? Two Sikh bodyguards. Punjabis, no, even I am a Punjabi. <laughs> 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 right? Two Sikh bodyguards. Uh, I, I forget the name. Uh, Bian Singh, Tehar Singh, Satwan Singh, two amongst them. Okay. Now, who killed Rajiv Gandhi in 1991? A girl called Dhanu. Whom people call Tamil. But I say first tell me her religion. She was a Hindu. Hindu, Tamil. Then two other examples I'll add. In 1958, a Buddhist Ming monk killed the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, S. W. Pandar Naike, 1958. In 2006, in Norway, a Christian young man called Anders Berling Breivik who is a great admirer of Hindu politics. That's the part. That's not the part I was talking. Okay. He's a great admirer of that. He killed 86 people with his machine gun in a span of few hours. Five examples are given. So first question comes, have terrorists come only from amongst the Muslims or from all the communities? All the communities. Number two, have they been doing this act because of, uh, because of religion or because of politics? That's a question which we have to think. I hope you are able to answer this very simple question. Does, uh, does any mother in the world give birth to a terrorist? No, obviously not. Those who are very sensitive, very critical. Mother gives birth only to a beautiful, lovely child. How that child becomes a terrorist, number one. How becomes a terrorist or made a terrorist? It rhymes better in Hindi. Wo atankwadi banta hai ya? And now this is the basic mechanism which we have to understand. Why somebody will become a terrorist out of like such wonderful opportunities are also there. Deprivations are also there. That I know. World is not fair. World is totally unjust. But opportunities are also there. Why somebody will choose a path of terror? And there by and large the basic observation is when somebody perceives, feels that injustice being done against that person or injustice being done against his community, or injustice being done against his nation, crosses a threshold. Now that, because injustice is very subjective, right? When injustice crosses the threshold, some people take to the path of terror. Of course, because as I am very clear about it, that level of injustice will be very different, because some people sitting in the audience may be saying that this lecture is also injustice. <laughs> Etc. Etc. All those sort of things are there. So I'm not going into that. So that is one. And second is how terrorists are made. Now terrorists are made. Two examples I give. I hope some of you might have read about Swami Asimanan's statements today in the paper. That is one. And second, of course, that famous example of uh, uh, what is the name? Who has died? Osama bin Laden. Right? You all recall two aeroplanes hijacked. What they say, what they say. I'm going, I'm not going by conspiracy theory, theory and what is there because that's a chapter by itself. Those who are interested can refer to the website. Very simple to remember. What really happened.com. Okay, very simple to remember. So I'm not going into the details of the real theory of that. Two aeroplanes allegedly hijacked. They come and strike against that twin tower World Trade Center. With that collapse, building collapse like this. Now again, there is a very mystery about it. Why building did not go like this? Why it could not go like that? How such a massive building could come down with the attack of two aeroplanes which are minuscule compared to the size and the strength of the building? But that should not distract us from the basic topic. So basic thing, building comes down. With that, nearly 3,000 people get killed. Number one. Now can you answer me? Uh, the people who get killed, these people are guilty people or innocent people? Innocent. 
innocent, number one. Number two, the people who got killed, they were belonging to which country? World Trade Center. It's not United States. They belong to practically all the countries of the world. Number three, to which religion they belong? All the religions. When 3,000 people belonging to most of the countries, all the religions got, got killed, after that, few hours after that, that dreaded man, fortunately he's dead, by uh, that America attack, Pakistan, it is not called attack, but it was the attack. About about they landed up and they killed a person that he was a terrorist. No law, no trial, nothing, nothing. We are the law. So we don't have to take any permission. They entered Pakistan and they killed Osama bin Laden. No, no complaints, okay? Few hours after this 9-11 attack, Osama bin Laden is seen on the TV. And he says, I am very happy. This is jihad. More such acts should take place. And I am thankful to Allah for doing this thing. So all these things, I can't interrogate Osama bin Laden. But we can discuss amongst ourselves. What he's saying is true or not? Number one. Number one, the people who got killed were innocent people. They are not the guilty people. So my question comes, does any religion in the world teach us to kill innocent people? Yes or no? No. no. Does Islam teach us to kill innocent people? No. Some people say no, others say maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I will ask, uh, why, why I am asking about Islam separately? Even if you say Islam does not teach, I am saying about separately because the popular perception is that probably something is there in the Quran bomb making formula that's available in the Google also and because of that people read it and they turn terrorists overnight. I think this is the biggest type of misconception and to break this I'll give two very simple references. One reference is uh, you must be knowing that Shah Rukh Khan, of course I should be careful about because Shah Rukh Khan has also been labeled anti-national very easily. Okay. Shah Rukh Khan said film my name is and what is the favorite dialogue my name is Khan and I am not a terrorist right. This is one dialogue but in the same film a very serious quotation is given, which many of us might have missed. Same film tells us, and Shura, Shah Rukh Khan's mouth, that Quran chapter 5, verse 32, tells us that even if you kill a single innocent person, not 3,000, even if you kill a single innocent person, that is like killing the whole humanity. So my question is, friends, what Osama bin Laden is saying, is it in accordance with Islam or opposed to Islam? It is opposed to Islam. But still, perception is yes. Muslim, Islam, terrorism, that equation has been firmly established. Basically, friends, before I go into the deeper nitty-gritties of the how terrorism came up in the West Asia, let's try to make a broader bird's eye view. And two, three questions I will ask. This is very commonsensical question. People of which religion are the biggest victim of terrorist violence? Hold on, hold on. People of which religion are the biggest victim of terrorist violence? What I mean by that, they, they, I'll give you three options. Muslims, <coughs> Hindus, or Christians. <coughs> Muslims are the biggest victims of this, number one. Number second question. Now, I'm drawing a triangle. And this triangle has three arms. One is West Asia. West Asia has a rich resource of particular mineral which we call black gold, oil. In the same area, maximum acts of terror are there. In the same area, the population of Muslims is overwhelming. So I simply say Islam should, whether uh, this terrorism should be related to Islam or to oil. A commonsensical thing will say that by and large, if terrorism was to be because of Islam, now, this is a very simple question again. If terrorism was there because of the Islam, in which country of the world you should see maximum number of terrorists? Indonesia, very simple. But Indonesia does not witness such a type of violence. You don't find daily that, oh, two young men are walking on the street and having a dialogue. First fellow asks the second, hello? How many people you killed? <laughs> second asks the first fellow, hello? What is your latest weapon? That is not there. This is there in West Asia. And friends, the story actually begins much earlier. Much earlier. In the same area, with the formation of Israel, 14 lakh Palestinians were displaced. 14 lakh Palestinians were displaced. And from amongst those Palestinians, some terrorists came up. 
and the initial group of terrorists in which a girl, young girl, 21, 20 year old, Laila Khalil, they organized a group, they attacked Israeli contingent in Olympic Games. In that time, Islam was not involved. Let me tell you, Palestinians, majority Muslims, but part of them were Christians also. Now, in formation of Israel, as a watchman on the oil reserve, that is one point. Second point, in 1953, in 1953, Iran had democratic elections. And in that democratic elections, one prime minister, one person come, came to be elected, his name was Mossadegh. Mossadegh, democratically elected prime minister. And he does a fatal mistake in the eyes of the rulers of the world sitting in White House. What is the mistake he does? Mossadegh say, hello, oil reserves are over, but the major profits are going to America and Britain. So why I don't nationalize the oil? Poor fellow nationalized oil wells. So America's response is very natural. How dare you have your own oil for yourself when we are sitting here? Every wealth belongs to us. Earlier the Britons, now the wealth belongs to us. So Mossadegh was overthrown. And when he was overthrown, Raza Shah Belvi, a stooge of the Western powers, who later on because of his policies was replaced by Islamic fundamentalist Ayatollah Khomeini, that came into power. Number three. The later story begins from 1970s and early 80s. And this, this is a very brilliant book. I hope your library has got it. Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. Of course, there is also, uh, this is the title of the book. But I am saying, these are people saying, good terrorists, bad terrorists. There is nothing like good terrorists or bad terrorists. But the title of the book by Mahmoud Mamdani, one of the basic research, tells us, based on the documents of CIA, based on extensive research, Mahmoud Mamdani tells us how, how cleverly, America supported, encouraged, proliferated the madrasas located in Pakistan. How cleverly they ensured that the Salafi Wahhabi version of Islam, which is very regressive, very sectarian, very narrow, and which is in collusion with the rulers of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, least of them Muslims in my language, right? They are the biggest ally of America. So Salafi, Salafi version of Islam and America supported it just by 8,000 million dollars and 7,000 tons of armaments. Now, so from these madrasas located in Pakistan, the one last example was seen when Musharraf was the president. He got one Lal Masjid in Lahore attack. Why? Because this cancer grew out of proportion and it led to that. So from these madrasas, first Mujahideen, then Taliban, then Al-Qaeda in the particular sequence came up. And a Saudi prince called Osama bin Laden was asked to lead this in which America supported by 8,000 million dollars, 7,000 tons of armament. Now, what was the idea? Why they went into this? That time, I hope my friends recall, world was bipolar world. Bipolar, there were two superpowers. Russia had a good match in America. Uh, sorry, Russia. America had a good match in Russia. Now, Russian armies occupied Afghanistan. I will not go details. Russia thought they are trying to help the democratic revolution. But obviously it was a world where uh, occupying any other country is a crime by any order. So when Russian forces occupied Afghanistan, America thought of retaliating it. Retaliating it. But America had problems because American armies, which are ready to invade any country at the drop of the hat, that time those armies were a bit reluctant. Why? Because their morale was down. Why was their morale down? Vietnamese, Vietnam War, Vietnamese people had, uh, people, people defeated the army. Remember the sentence, I'm saying with full amount of consciousness. American people defeated, uh, Vietnamese people defeated American army, American army got demoralized. That's a sad chapter in the world history, how America invaded these newly liberating countries and what sort of impact. Anyway, American armies demoralized. So what to do? So American president, and that time there was one very clever secretary of Henry Kissinger. Now they came with a brilliant formula that uh, if we can't send our armies to West Asia, to Afghanistan, no problem. We will fight our battle through the Muslim youth of Asia. No problem. I mean, our youth are safe here. So what to do? That's how they encourage these madrasas from with this type of terror, terror attacks came in. And the whole thing 
which came up was again the battle for oil. And this, when again you must be remembering, America attacking Iraq. I have no sympathies with Saddam Hussein. But I appreciate Saddam Hussein for one thing, which is missing in many other places, and that he encouraged Muslim girls' education to the sky. And one of my colleagues in IIT, when he went to Iraq, he was practically taken off his feet. That in an engineering college, when he visits the engineering college, the number of girls in the class is more than the number of boys. He actually got uh, uh, shaken, uh, what is happening, whether I'm in the right place or not. Anyway, so that Saddam Hussein was attacked on the ground that he is hiding weapons of mass destruction. Interestingly, I tell you how this divide and rule policy plays. Saddam Hussein was propped up by America. Very nice. Why? To fight against Ayatollah Khomeini. The job is done. I want to remind of one very popular article by Arundhati Roy. I don't know how many you must have, might have read. Uh, he, he, I, I hope you all know one. Hindi word, uh, Hindustani word, Faida. Faida means profit. She discusses all this Al-Qaeda, etc., etc. And finally she says, uh, uh, because that time Al-Qaeda was very on the rise, this was on the uh, type uh, when this book, uh, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, was released. So that time, Arundhati Roy, in ending the article, says, she says, tell, tell me, she asks the question, tell me, who's more dangerous in the world? Al-Qaeda or Al-Faida? So that's where, the, that's where she ends the article and that's a very sharp critique on the whole thing. Now this is one, one side. Another thing I'll just uh, probably tell you, which is very sad, it's a very big, uh, big topic, I'm not covering all the points, but you, I hope you remember, recall that again yesterday, that uh, Headley, Headley, that fellow, who again is giving newer, newer type of uh, incident, uh, Mumbai 2611. And Mumbai 2611, we lost a very bold, honest officer. His name was Heman Karkare. When Heman Karkare got killed, there is an interesting book on his life also, Who Killed Karkare. I will not go into that particular thing. But when, uh, uh, you may be remembering, at that time there was a spate of terrorist attacks. We were all disturbed. Like Makkah Masjid, Malegaon, Ajmer, Samjata Express, Nanded, Aurangabad, Parbani, etc. etc. Attacks were going on. And after every attack, by a very cold, calculated logic, or lack of it, sorry, by a very cold, calculated lack of understanding, professionalism. After every attack, police had a very mechanical duty. What is the mechanical duty? To arrest 30, 40 Muslim young men, say that in their pocket, in there is a Urdu letter, there is a phone number, and they are related to this organization, that organization. This whole thing got busted with when Hemant Karkare started investigating Malegaon. And in Malegaon, he came across, he apprehended the motorbike of that, uh, that Sadhvi Pragya Singh Thakur, who is again in the news, that uh, poor friend Sunil Joshi was killed because he had a crush on him, sorry for that. Okay, right. Now this uh, Pragya Singh Thakur, now she, when she, she was, uh, uh, this uh, chain, Hemant Karkare started another thing, from uh, Pragya Singh Thakur to Dayanand Pandey, to Lieutenant Colonel Prasad Shrikant Puri, and finally it landed up to Swami Asimanan. I'll recommend you, please read uh, Swami's uh, Lord Confession in a caravan magazine. It full was there, it is available with me, I can pass it on as a soft copy also. Swami's, uh, Swami's long interview with caravan in journalist. And, but in summary, the story is Swamiji, finally the uh, lead went to Swamiji, he was arrested, and when he was arrested, he was uh, jailed. In the jail, he came across a Muslim young man. His name was Kaleem. Kaleem was probably 20, 22 years old uh, young man. And uh, Kaleem, uh, Swamiji, uh, he was helping Kaleem. Uh, Swamiji was being helped by Kaleem in various small chores and all that. So Swamiji became very happy with that boy. Yeah, the boy is doing service to me, so why not be a bit affectionate to him? So Swamiji started talking to him. One day he asked Kaleem, Beta Kaleem, how come you are in jail? So Kaleem said honestly, Swamiji, I will not hide anything from you. You are such a pious person. What does he know about piety anyway? Right. <laughs> you are such a pious person. Swamiji, I am a small thief. I am a thief. I keep coming, going to jail regularly. But Swamiji, I was arrested in the context of Makkah Masjid Blast six months ago. When he said I was arrested in the context of Makkah Masjid Blast, Swamiji, something hit Swamiji because Swamiji had started liking the boy. 
And when he said, I was arrested for the sake of Makkah Masjid, Swamiji that night could not sleep. If I say in popular Hindi, Swamiji ne kaha reyaar, Makkah Masjid blast to hum ne kiya. We got it done, the poor fellow got arrested. And he was so disturbed, he could not sleep. Next day morning, he calls the jailer. He says, sir, you please call a magistrate. I want to give my confession. Obviously, you know how Polish extorts confession. Fortunately, that is not believed. That is the right thing. Anyway, so magistrate was called. Majid, he, Swamiji started giving his confession. And Swamiji said, uh, even before taking the confession, uh, magistrate told him, Swamiji, please be careful. Whatever you are going to tell in front of me may be used as a evidence against you and you can even be punished, given the death penalty. Swamiji said, no, 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 today I am going to speak what is the truth. And he gave the whole story, how after uh, Varanasi, that Sankat Mochan blast, people like him thought that, abhi eat ka jawab patthar se dena chahiye. And of course, you know, our, our, uh, that Shiv Sena chief who is no more there, uh, ha, ha, same, same, same. Uh, he had also once said, Ki, uh, we, we, we should go for suicide squad, suicide squad. That we should have encouraged young people to become terrorists, right? Anyway, so when uh, he said that after this Sankat Mochan class, we decided that we'll form bomb making factory, we will train the youth, we'll get RDX from here, we will get that, and that's how they organized the terrorist campaign. I'm very sad to say that I had uh, uh, I had a duty to sit on two tribunals about uh, uh, this holy cow and uh, scapegoat, scapegoats and the holy cow, scapegoats and the holy cow. After every act of terror, arrest Muslim youth. And after few years, release them. How many careers were spoiled by the process, you can't say. I, in those tribunals, I heard the cry, anguish of the mothers, the fathers, how the young Muslim boys, because of this prejudice, understanding of the society, lost their careers, lost their everything, etc. etc. So friends, basically I say, today we are in a, living in a times when the prejudices, biases, stereotypes rule our politics. And religion, which should be a moral force, religion which should be a moral force, is being used by two dreaded acts of politics. One is communalism, second is terrorism. Both these are deeper political process which we need to understand and what I will urge upon you that let's go beyond the obvious, let's go beyond what is visible, let's try to see the real phenomenon because we want to live in a society where we can live uh, with freedom, dignity and that should be for all of us, that's what we need for our time. Thank you very much.